Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, I want to read verses 14 through 18, and then as soon as I'm done reading and praying, uh, Brother Mikhail will come sing and we'll get to preaching a, a message. I'm starting tonight, I'm telling you, I can't finish it, this may turn into a series, but I want to preach to you for the next few Sunday nights on the doctrine of separation. Amen. The doctrine of separation. If you're able to stand, join me standing, verses 14 down through verse number 18. Looking together on your King James Bible, would you read it with me together? We'll read together as one verse, pardon me, as one voice, verses 14 through 18. Join me together, one voice, ready, begin. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness, and what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. All God's people said, Amen. Father, now bless, I pray, Michael, as he sings. May the song, the words, the lyrics, the melody bring peace and joy to our hearts. And I pray as well the word of God would dwell within our hearts richly tonight. Lord, let this not just be another time of preaching but may it be a time of understanding, instruction, conviction, challenge, and helpful, uh, hopeful helpfulness. And we'll pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. I'm beginning a message, a series of messages, if you will, uh, on the subject of separation. And this isn't uh, uh, any other reason other than the fact, listen, that if there's a single topic through the Bible next to redemption, that is emphasized, the greatest is separation. Yes, sir. Redemption is throughout. It is the, the, the center of every teaching in the scriptures, redemption. But throughout the Bible, you will find this subject of separation. Now, my purpose tonight is to take this passage of scripture and then a multitude of other texts and show you just two things tonight. First of all, we're going to look at the beginning, the be, uh, pardon me, the behavior of separation, the behavior, and then secondly, the beginning of separation. And then next Lord's Day, I'll continue this, and we'll talk about uh, the basis of separation, and we'll get into some other things as we go along. So in, in the case that you don't understand this doctrine, this passage of Scripture points it out very clearly by way of two words. And I want you to notice in our text reading, 2 Corinthians 6, especially verse number 17. Now there are two words there that I'd like to draw your attention to. And if you would make notes tonight, this is going to be a kind of a Bible teaching preaching. And I, I really challenge you to, to invest your own self into words written down to help you recall uh, some of what uh, uh, we talk about tonight also in your personal Bible. Yeah. Two words. Notice the first word. I want you to notice verse 17. The word them. The preposition them. So in the context of the verse, we're to separate from them. So we understand, first of all, that separation includes people. Some of you aren't going to like what I'm teaching tonight. It's going gonna, it's gonna to jade you a little bit. But if you're going to be a Bible Christian, you have to understand that God says, wherefore, come out from among, what's the word? Them. them. There's a second word in that verse. Can you find it there? The unclean thing. So we're to separate from people. And secondly, we're to separate from practices. Thing. The unclean thing. We could say synonym, synonym to that would be practices. So we see separation clearly in this passage. Now, I'm not going to preach both of those, uh, those pronouns. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to speak on that first one. They were to separate from people. And again, I said that's a, a little bit awkward today. Would you agree with me? 
I saw a young girl today, I was out running this afternoon, and uh, she and three or four other kids were at the park, and she had this big shirt on, and it said, Unity. Now, I'm for unity. Unity's a big deal. By the way, we need to have unity in our church, yeah. and we do. We've got great unity, thank God for that. Uh, but, ladies and gentlemen, as a Christian, I have to understand that sometimes God does not want me to be in unity. Uh, someone said, well, you know, God is all about no confusion. And the Bible does say God is not the author of confusion. But I will tell you this, God one day confused a whole bunch of people. As they were unified, what were they doing? Somebody tell me. Building a tower to heaven. And God came down and disrupted their unity. He confounded them and so we're going to look into that. How many think this is kind of interesting already? Raise your hand. How many feel like there's a waste of time? I want to go home, get the hot dogs out now. Just kidding. I won't keep you long. I promise you. We'll, we'll move through this rather quickly. I said, first of all, I want to, uh, if you're going to make notes, I want you to remember this, the behavior of separation. Now, this is, just, this is just some observations that I want to give from the start because I don't want anyone here having a misunderstanding to begin with, of what is separation. So I've get, I have a list of six things that I want to give you what separation is not. The behavior of separation. First of all, uh, um, let me give it to you this way. I'm going to get to my, my other note here. Separation uh, uh, is not, and uh, uh, where are my notes? Here we go. Uh, first of all, when I talk about separation, I do not mean to be unkind, unfriendly, or mean. When we talk about separation, separating from people, we're never to be unkind, unfriendly, or mean. There's a chance to say amen. You see, I already did say amen. Well, I repeated it because it was a weak amen. I'm talking about even with those you disagree with. I'm talking about those who go against your fundamental core beliefs. Dare I mention a few? How about the Muslims? How about the homosexuals? How about the transgenders? You see, listen to me, this is right in our eyeballs tonight. Those we disagree with. Christians must, and remember this, Christians must imitate Jesus always. I'm going to say it again. Christians must imitate Jesus always. Always. Now, you can be kind and not join in fellowship. And so we have to find that balance. So separation is never a permit to be ugly or unkind. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Number two, when I talk about separation, I do not mean for it to be a movement of isolationism or no contact with people. Although, man, I'm telling you anymore, I'm kind of feeling that a little cabin up on a mountainside, Amen. off the grid, come on, help me now, Johnny, you're with me. You know, no, no Walmarts, no 52 in Red Bank Road, somebody say amen. I'm really kind of thinking, you know, but when we talk about separation, that's not what we're talking about. One fundamental reason for that. Why in the world are we breathe in air, Greg, Greg, Greg uh, Schaefer? Yes, but why are we breathing air, preacher? To, reach people the gospel. to get people out of hell and into heaven. Yeah. And you can't do that keeping your mouth shut, living on some hillside all by yourself with your AK-47 knocking people out as they come up your hill. We can't do that. We have to be salt and light. What is that? What is that? You can't be that if you isolate from the world and isolate from people. Can't do it. You have a neighborhood. You have a street. You have neighbors. I had neighbors here today in this church. And, uh, uh, and, and Lord will have other neighbors. And so we're supposed to uh, uh, be separate, but we don't mean, I'm talking about the behavior of separation. It doesn't mean to isolate. It doesn't mean to uh, have no contact. Number three, write this down. When I talk about Separation. I'm not talking about Phariseeism. Phariseeism. Better than. Hello? 
Uh, nobody is better than. You know, I really think when God looks at somebody who acts like they're better than, he must get some kind of chuckle out of it because all he sees is one piece of dirt looking down on another piece of dirt. Who do you think you are if you look down on somebody, especially as a Christian? I mean, really, uh, we, we've got to understand that this thing of separation doesn't mean because you're something. Because the fact is, oh, you are just an old chunk of coal, amen. And God reached you out of the mire pit of life and he rescued you. And the only difference between you and them is Jesus is in there. But it doesn't make you any better. We're all sinners saved by grace. Number four, when I talk about separation, the behavior separation, it does not, it does not allow separating over unimportant things. And so your fourth point is this. We're not talking about separating over non-important things. I've been pastoring 37 plus years. I've seen people separate over they do Christmas and we don't. Are you kidding me? you got some feathers where there ought to be brain matter. Amen? You don't separate over things like that. Uh, 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 this, this thing, uh, 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 so many items. I, I, I got a whole list up here. I don't have time to go into them. But let me give you a scripture on that. Romans 14, 5. Romans 14, 5. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Who art thou, verse 4 says, that judgest thy brother? So ladies and gentlemen, be fully persuaded in your own mind of those non-important things. Now, we're not talking about doctrine. And we're not talking about fundamentals. We're talking about non-importance. Everybody get what I'm talking about? The behavior of separation uh, is, is not, well, uh, I, I wear a tie to church and he doesn't, so I'm separating. No, we're not doing that. Now, guess what? We're going to keep wearing ties to church. I said we're going to keep, I know I hate them too, but we're going we're gonna to dress up and go to church. Okay, we're going to keep that honor to the Lord. Uh, but we're not separating over non-important things. Number five, write this down. i got to hurry up. i got one more after that. So five, then six. So the fifth one is this. We're not separate. When we talk about separation, we're not talking about separating from a fellow Christian who has fallen and is trying to get right. Because one day coming, you're going to probably stumble. Help me, church. One day coming. Hey, what does the Bible say? Galatians 6, 1, ye that are spiritual, restore such one. Amen? When a brother or a sister, somebody told me tonight, they messed up last week, and here's what I said, keep on going, man. Amen? You dirty backslider. Get thee behind me. Oh, no. No, we're not talking about that. A Christian, uh, pardon me, a, a person, a Christian seeking to get right with God, we're, we're told restore such an one. And that ought to be, this is a hospital, not a police station. All right, number six, this is the last one that I can get into the good preaching. Uh, number six, uh, when I talk about separation, or when we talk about separation, or when the Bible talks about separation, it is not speaking to a mentality like the inquisitors. We're not seeking to separate as inquisitors. There are some people I've pastored that would have been better as holy Roman Catholic inquisitors than members of a Baptist church because they look for something they can press people about and strain people about and what I call today the Facebook police. Could I just say this to you though? Would you please grow up with your Facebook postings? You'll help all of us. You'll settle us down because, man, we're worried you're not even saved by some of the stuff you post. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about whoever's watching on, face, on, li on Facebook Live. Because <laughs> I think, listen, don't, please, don't give us such anxiety over your awkward and fragile Christian life because what you're putting on there, it, you're saying one thing and you're doing another and you're making us nervous. Yeah. Cut it out. But we don't want to be inquisitors. Can I hear an amen? So have I lost the crowd already? I'm just telling you the behavior of separation. I, I, I refuse to be the Facebook police. I, I refuse to be uh, uh, run around chase. I'm not going to follow your car around. 
Amen. I have to tell you this. I, my wife and I, she, she was, she's always, always the best mother. I mean it. And one day she said to me, she said, honey, would you go up to uh, what, those video stores? You remember those videos you'd get? Um, Blockbuster. That's exactly the place. And it was a snowstorm. Everything was shut down. Man, there's something about that. There's about a foot and a half of snow. Everything gets quiet, you know, it's nighttime. And she says, honey, go get old Yeller. Amen. So I went up to the, to the Blockbuster up on Cherry Street Extension there in Hoyoke, Massachusetts. And uh, I pull in there. Man, it's a beautiful night. I walk in there, and, and uh, Blockbuster had all the, you know, the different sections, you know, the fiction and the nonfiction, and et cetera, et cetera. And I, I don't think I'd ever been in the place but this one time. And she sent me, and I'm a good husband, Brother Allen, and I do what she says. And so I went up here to get old Yeller, and back, back in the corner was the X and the R-rated, or, or maybe R-rated, I don't know, but they were the bad movies. And, uh, and it was, a, you know, they had a curtain up there, and, you know, you couldn't get in without the curtain. It said 18 and older, 21, whatever. And so I see that when I come in, and I'm, I'm feeling a little red-eared. You know, you know what I mean by that? This little red ear, little blush popping in here. Because I'm a pastor out there. I'm starting this church. I've been there a few years, you know. Little four little kids. And I'm going to get old yeller. And that's all I'm after. And I turn around. And there's a man from a fellowship church right around there. And, and I turned and saw him. His name Mike Thoreau. And I turned. I saw Mike. And right over his shoulder was the R-rated section. And I looked at Mike. And he said, and he had a speech impediment. He said, Pastor Thorpe. And I said, old yeller. He said, okay, no, really, old yeller. That's what I'm after, old yeller. I brought that thing home and I said to her, woman, long as I live, get thee behind me, Satan. I'm never, I'm never going back in that place. I didn't want the speculation. I, I didn't want Mike Thoreau, who was a good man, to, to go back to his home and wonder, was that preacher in that R-rated place? Is everybody catching what I'm saying? I know you can't preach this way in a lot of churches, but I want to tell you right now, we need to return uh, to separation so we don't get ourselves in such trouble. I'll never forget, I went into a Starbucks years and years ago in California, and uh, a fellow that had been coming to our church for some time, and he just stopped coming abruptly. I walked into the Starbucks. I went in there all the time to get a coffee, and I walk in, and there he is, and and he's sitting at a, at a little table, and, uh, and I walked in. He didn't see me, and I got my coffee, and I came around. He's on his laptop, and I came around and I said, Hey, Brother Rick, and he went, Hi, Pastor Tharp. Anybody see a problem with that? What's going on? I'm just, I don't know what he was doing. I don't care. But God knew. God knows. He might have been looking at Superman videos and he just thought he didn't want me to think he's a little boy or something. I, I don't want to think evil of anybody, but I do know this. A maturing Christian is going to be really, really, really careful about giving any suspicion, even though we're never called to be the judge, jury, and examiner of anybody. Amen, church? How many think that helped a little bit? Say amen. So we're looking at the behavior of separation. Now let me move along to the second thought and this is as far as I'll go tonight. Is that all right? I'm asking you, is that okay? Or do you want me to just keep preaching? No, I want hot dogs. One, the behavior of separation. Then number two, I want to talk to you about the beginning of separation. Now, this is interesting. The beginning of separation. I want you to look in your Bibles, if you would, to Isaiah chapter number 14. Would you kindly go over there, Isaiah chapter 14. Now this is going to be a fun Bible study and you do want to make notes. You really, really want to be informed on this. Isaiah 14, some of you already know, Isaiah 14 is that very familiar chapter along with Ezekiel 28 that talks about the origin of who? The devil or Lucifer. He's Lucifer in heaven. So let's look what happens here in verse number 13 and 14. Is everybody there? Now let's look at it carefully. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will, also, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. 
Now, this is the fatal flaw of Satan or Lucifer. His pride, his, his uh, esteeming himself above God, he, he lifts himself up. And because of that, and I'm summarizing the whole biblical narrative here, if I could get your attention back, his, his work here at usurping God, being like God, above God, it resulted in him leading one-third of all the angels to fall, and they all fell with him. Now notice what God's response was in verse 15. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms, that made the world uh, as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof that opened not the house of his prisoners that goes on. Uh, and here's what I want you to catch on this passage. When Lucifer sinned, God separated him. I want you to think about that. God separated himself from Lucifer. Now I want you to understand this. And Keep thinking with me, church. I don't want to lose you. God did not seek to negotiate with Lucifer. He did not. He did what? What did God do? Separate. Okay, let's keep picking this apart. God did not seek a meeting of the minds. There was none of that. God did set. God did set a pattern here. And we're going to look at that. But God did not set an example of conciliation. Does everybody understand that? There is no, watch this, there is no love here above differences. None. There's none of that at all. His focus was strictly one thing. God's focus was one thing, separation. This is what the Bible teaches. So by separating Lucifer from himself, hear me, hear me, by God separating Lucifer from himself, he established a divine principle for all time, for all creatures to follow. This is God's doing. God did that. Let's, let's even go, let's stay in the realm of creation, can we? Let's look a little bit more at this thing of separation. Or the Bible uses the word divide. Let's consider the creation. So we, we obviously will go to Genesis 1. So if you would, go over there, Genesis chapter number 1. And let's look at the days of creation. Just a few of them. And this is such fun. I love doing this. Uh, my wife loves studying the days of creation. She's very educated in most things. And we talk about this on that fourth day, you know, and the sun, moon, and stars. We just love studying these things. But let's just... Look at it in order and look at the, the divine pattern that we see here. The first day, notice verse, uh, verses 3 and 4. It says, And God said, Let there be light. And there was light, and God saw the light, that it was good. Now notice it. And God, what's the word, church? Divided, divided the light from the darkness. So divided is a very similar word to separated. So somehow God did that. It's a miracle. Second day, verses 6 through 8. Notice it, I don't have time to read it, but he, he divided the firmament. So God, God established the sky order. We know there are three heavens. And so God established the order of the heavens, the, the terrestrial, the, the intraterrestrial, the outer space. God established the firmament. The, number, verse, the third day, the third day God divided the earth from the waters. And so he made the, the fishing holes. Somebody say hallelujah right there. And he made the dry ground. Again, you can't have dry ground with wet. He divided these things. The fourth day, I'm just giving you a pattern. This is all God's doing. This is, and it might be elemental to some of you, but it's important we, we be reminded that this thing of separation is a divine pattern. The fourth day, the sun, moon, and the stars, the luminaries, if you will. And look at verse number 14 of chapter 1. It, it says, And God said, Let the, there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. Uh, verse, uh, skip down to verse 17. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night 
and to divide the light from the darkness and God saw that it was good. So how many will agree tonight that God absolutely has established a pattern of separation? This is God's doing. This is how God works. Uh, God, God created these things and did these things and watch this, and enumerated these things with the purpose of educating us this is how God works. Let's continue the thought. Without the boundaries that God put in creation, there would be nothing but chaos and out of control. Aren't you glad that the sun rises and the sun sets? And those that have ever fished in the ocean, the tides come and the tides go. And we understand these boundaries brought life and order. How did they come? They came, they came through separation. Separation. He put all things in proper place and order. And boy, when I say that, I just kind of go, Phew. God knew what he was doing. God put it all in order. I am fighting my preaching tonight so much because what's going on in this country is a revulsion of what I'm preaching right now. I am a man, but I want to be a woman. Is, is this troubling anybody in this church? Here's the problem with you. Is it just troubles you, but you don't have much Bible. It just revolts you. I have found, Pastor, I have found most people are revolted in their nature, but they don't have much Bible behind this. I'm just telling you, one of the most fundamental reasons this transgender craze that's going on and folks, if you think it's going to go away, you're nuts. It's going to get worse. I've said this three times in this pulpit, and this will be the fourth time I've said it, that what's coming next is pedophilia, the acceptance of, of uh, 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 child fascination. And you, you're appalled at that, aren't you, right now? You're feeling sick, but it's coming. You listen to me, it's coming. What's going on? It's a turning over of the order that God has established. That a man would marry a man or a woman would marry a woman. Yeah, we're revolted at that. We can't understand that. Nobody wants their child to grow up and be that. Nobody does. But what happens is a child shoves that down their parent's throat. And the parent has got to accept it to get along with that child. And guess what? I'll leave it right there. Because I have no advice for you. If that is what's come on your life, you need what that man's saying about tonight. Grace. Because I will never accept that abomination. Yes, sir. Amen. Get it. Guess what? God said what he said. Whether I like it or not. Whether I agree with it or not. Did you know something? God is not interested at all whether you agree with him or not. Doesn't phase him. God's not up in heaven wondering, are the Republicans going to vote for me? God's not concerned with that. None that concerns him. So I, I, I guess all we can do is just say, I'll take God's position. I'll tell you what, that takes a load off your shoulders. Let's take God's position. And again, I'm not going to separate from everybody just because of this or that. I'm going to understand what separation is. That's where we're going with this. So let's, where am I at? What am I talking about? I'm talking to you right now about uh, um, the, um, the second thing, the beginning of separation. And we talked about Lucifer, how God separated him. And we talked about separation in creation, right? We did that. Well, let's, let's move to a second thing. So God shows us his pattern of separation in how he dealt with Lucifer, creation, and that whole era. Let's move forward just a little bit, just a little bit. And talk about Adam and Eve. Talk about Adam and Eve. God separated Adam and Eve from the garden. He put them there. A perfect environment, a perfect relationship, everything perfect, no sin. And then Adam and Eve sinned. And just like Lucifer, they were enjoying perfect fellowship in a perfect environment. Adam and Eve had heaven on earth. All, people, all God's people said amen. It was a perfect place. Yet they also found themselves separated from God when they sinned. 
And they were pushed out of that place of peace and harmony and most, most importantly, fellowship with God. Who did this? God did this. God is the one that said, you're out. God put a flaming sword with an angel preventing them from coming back in. You see, God loved them too much to let them stay in their sinful, dead condition. So God had to put them out. God had to do that. God did it. I don't understand it. You don't understand it. But he did it. Now, why did he do it? Someone will say, because he disobeyed God. It's not entirely true. As a matter of fact, they adopted the doctrinal error that Satan had. The failure in Eden was not mere disobedience. You understand me? It was not mere disobedience. Rather, their act of disobedience was a result of false doctrine. They were persuaded to believe false doctrine by Satan. Lucifer came to Eve and tempted her, and he persuaded her. He persuaded our first parents to believe that God did not have the right to tell them how to behave. That's really the sin. That they thought, God, I can do it on my own. I don't need you. They assume some form of deity on themselves. This is fundamentally what's going on in our culture. These people that claim to be saved and sodomites at the same time, they're making themselves deity. And that is blasphemy. That's what's going on. I'm just telling you folks, this thing of separation has wide ramifications today. Even in this church. Even in the What's the name of this church? <laughs> Trident Baptist Church. We'll, we'll, we'll develop that. You see, they, they said, they said, because Satan said, well, you, you become gods. Uh -huh. And we're not reading the text. I, I don't have time to, to spend it. That's for your study. That's Genesis 3. And you get into that. And only after they were convinced of this false doctrine did she eat and then she gave unto her husband. Does everybody catch that? I know you've been told all your life it's about disobedience, but be honest here. It's way more than disobedience. Yea, hath God said. So from the modern mindset, and I'm, I'm going to play the advocate now, from the modern mindset, when Adam and Eve failed, from the modern mindset, that would have been a good moment, a prime moment, for God to show mankind that a little difference should not hinder fellowship. How many think this thing about what happened in the garden, be honest now, was a pretty small thing? I do. I mean, eat, eat a fruit? On the surface, from the modern mindset, see, you're way more spiritual than me, I can tell. <laughs> but, but all they did was eat of the fruit. But we know it's more than that, don't we, church? So from, from the modern mind, this, this could have been a good time for God to call them together and have a point of discussion. But no. What'd he do? What'd he do? He removed them entirely. As a matter of fact, he said they died. God was acting consistently with the angels and the first couple. Exactly true. But I want you to see something, though, verse 22 through 24, Genesis 3. And, I, and I'll have to stop here real quick. Uh, this is so rich, folks. That's so rich. Look at verse 22, Genesis 3. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand to take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. See, God says, I don't want to leave him in this corrupt condition. I want to leave him this way. He's just going to get worse and die. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed at the end east of the Garden of Eden cherubims, that's angels, and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. God was so compassionate. He said, I don't want you to stay in this condition. What condition, Pastor? The one that Lucifer was in. 
the one that Lucifer and the angels fell in. Now, unlike the angels, I'm teaching church, unlike the angels, God gave to mankind grace and mercy with a means of redemption. I'm going to say it again. God gave grace and mercy with a means of redemption. What was that means? It was evident in the killing of that animal and the covering with its skin. That was the first shedding of blood, a picture of redemption. The blood is always the means of redemption. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So glory to God, unlike the angels. The angels were given a one choice, and that was it. They fell from their natural habitation, their original habitation, and are now commissioned and consigned to the lake of fire to be. But God gives man grace, mercy, with a means of redemption. Man, there ought to be a book written with that title. Grace, mercy, and a means of redemption. Chapter 4 of Genesis, you read it. Would you read it later? When Cain and Abel got into their tiff, it was all over redemption. One wanted the fruit of the ground, the other said, I'm going to do what God told me to do. Where did Abel, Cain and Abel get the information? Got it from Adam and Eve. Where did Adam and Eve get the information? Genesis 3, when God sacrificed the animal. 3.15, the first messianic promise. And so Adam and Eve, uh, their, their son, all of it's a picture of grace. And so God provides us grace. Now, I'm going I'm to start to close. This pattern, this pattern of separation, this pattern of division is repeated throughout Scripture. It's repeated in, in, in individuals. I'm just going to give you a long list. Individuals, nations, ceremonies, feasts, High days, clothing, buildings, laws, disease, Sabbath days, physical circumcision. All of those are all parts and pictures of God's imposed principle of separation. That's just Old Testament. I could go on and on and on. We will later. He separated Adam and Eve from the place of perfection and fellowship, banished them forever from there, opposite the angels. They fell. They were not given opportunity to repent, but Adam and Eve were, and we thank God for that. So the means of redemption, God separated sinful man from fellowship with himself, but promised that they could be redeemed through the blood. Praise the Lord. Uh, uh, I got to give you one more, one more. I give you Lucifer, the angels and creation. I give you Adam and Eve. And then let's just think, and I'll close with Israel. Here's the point number three. God separated Israel from all other nations. Amen, church? You say, ah, you're getting into stuff. A little tough for me to understand how God chooses a nation. Look at me, listen to me. God chose the Jews. They're my people. They're the smallest of the people, but they're mine. And I have to stop. Man, I could go on and you just don't know the notes I have up here. Write the scripture down, though. You can read it this week. Deuteronomy 7. Would you read that this week? Deuteronomy 7. And look at what God enumerates here that he points out. He tells them in so many verses that you are to do this, 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 this. Why? To be separate. Why should we do that, God? Because you are this, 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 this to me. (laughs) And so we're talking about the beginning of separation And I think um, we'll stop there. But I I do want to read you. uh, I'll read it to you. You don't need to go over there. I think we'll close with Deuteronomy 7. I'll just read you uh, a verse or two there and we'll stop. Is everybody all right? It says this. He says, For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself. Above all people that are upon the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any people, for ye were the fewest of all people, but because the Lord loved you. Somebody raise your hand. You say, that's talking to the Jews. You're right. But Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Sing it now. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. 
the Bible tells me so. And so, will you learn from your God? God wants you to be a separate people. Maybe tonight the Holy Spirit has put something in your heart you've embraced that you ought to reject. You've embodied something and taken it into your spirit and your life, something that God has told you he's not happy with. Here's what I suggest. Repent. Give it back to God. And let's get victory in this thing of separation.